Russian forces have advanced over a key waterway in the eastern Ukrainian stronghold of Chasivya, a Ukrainian military official said, marking a setback for Kyiv's embattled forces. The town of Chasivya, which had an estimated pre-war population of around 12,000 people, sits on a strategic hilltop and its capture would likely speed Russian advances deeper in the war-battered Donetsk region. The enemy managed to break into our line of defense, but there is no critical failure and we are not about to lose Chasivya. Fierce fighting continues now, a spokesman for Ukraine's 24th Brigade told state-run media. The spokesman Ivan Petrichak said that while Russian troops had crossed the canal on the eastern edge of the city, Ukrainian troops were containing the advance. Experts say that Chasivya is a new Bakhmut for Russians. Nearly 20,000 Russian mercenaries died fighting for Wagner Group for the Wagner Group during the Battle of Bakhmut. Using the identification numbers of those killed, journalists were also able to determine that at least 48,000 prisoners fought for Wagner during this time. Dmitro Snyhiryov, a Ukrainian military expert, says that Chasivya is a hard target for Russians. He recalled that over the year of the Russian offensive in the Donetsk region, the Russian army has advanced 900 square kilometers. Currently, the Russians are solving the issue of reaching the administrative borders of the, of the Donetsk region, and they have been unsuccessfully solving it for a year of the Russian offensive. Let me remind you that the offensive has been going on since October 2023, not since May 2024. So the maximum advance of the Russians during the year of the Russian offensive is the corresponding preconditions for tactical success, a larger number of personnel, total enemy air superiority, and most importantly, the firepower coefficient, which, unfortunately, is in favor of the occupiers. So despite all these factors, as well as the corresponding delay in military and technical assistance from our partners, the maximum advance of the Russians is 900 square kilometers in the Donetsk region. The issue of getting to the borders of Donetsk region has not been resolved. He spoke about this on Espresso TV. Snehiryov believes that it will be difficult for Russian troops to advance. The Russians have quite serious defense lines of the Ukrainian defense forces ahead. We are talking about the Pokrovsk agglomeration, respectively the Slovyansk and Kramatorsk agglomerations, which are large industrial cities. And even though the Russians are currently using flanking tactics and the so-called small cauldron tactics, meaning that they are not engaging in assault operations directly in urban areas, we can say that further Russian advance in these industrial cities will take a rather serious period of time. Unless, again, there is an unclear nature of the rotations of the Ukrainian personnel, which, by a strange coincidence, will become known to the Russian occupiers. Unfortunately, a similar situation occurred during the battles for Avdiivka, Volodar, and other problematic areas of the front, which led to the Russian tactical successes. He emphasized, One day after the U.S. said 3,000 North Korean troops have been deployed to Russia and warned that those forces will be fair game if they go into combat in Ukraine, the Pentagon slammed Russian President Vladimir Putin, suggesting the move is one of desperation. Vladimir Putin has become so desperate that he is now willing and soliciting, you know, potentially support from the DPRK to put there their personnel on the battlefield, said Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh. Russian lawmakers ratified a pact with North Korea envisioning mutual military assistance. The lower house of the Russian parliament, the State Duma, voted quickly to endorse the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty that Russia's President Vladimir Putin signed with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on a visit to Pyongyang in June. The upper house is expected to follow suit soon. The pact obliges Russia and North Korea to immediately provide military assistance using all means if either is attacked. It marked the strongest link between Moscow and Pyongyang since the end of the Cold War. If the DPRK soldiers enter into combat, they would be co-belligerents, Singh said. And that is a very serious issue.
The Pentagon also weighed in on the humanitarian situation in Gaza as Secretary of State Antony Blinken traveled to Doha to meet with Qatari officials, who have been key mediators in the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. continues to struggle to break the logjam of ceasefire negotiations between Israel and the militant group. The humanitarian situation is as dire, Singh said. So we know that a ceasefire would be the best way to get, whether it be food, water, humanitarian needs in, as well as medical treatment, into Gaza. Finally, Singh said U.S. troops participated in an Iraqi-led operation against ISIS fighters in the Anbar province in Iraq. The Pentagon is evaluating the operation and was not aware of any U.S. casualties in the operation. Singh also provided an update on a joint raid by U.S. and Iraqi troops earlier this week that killed more than half a dozen Islamic State leaders in Iraq, but also left two U.S. troops injured. Singh said the two U.S. troops are in stable condition and will get follow-on care at Walter Reed National Military Center outside of Washington, D.C. She also said a third American service member is being evaluated for TBI. This really highlights Russia's desperation, um, you know, tin cupping to the DPRK to Iran, um, enticing DPRK soldiers, you know, if, if they were to ever enter the fight. Um, I think that shows that Putin has failed in his strategic objectives on the battlefield. Returned yesterday from a busy week of travel. A summary of Vladimir Putin has become so desperate that he is now willing and, and soliciting, um, you know, potentially support from the DPRK to put their their personnel on the battlefield. Um, and, you know, we're talking about uh, you know, over 500,000 um, casualties that, you know, Russia has experienced on the battlefield. Um, so if the DPRK soldiers enter into combat, um, they would be co-belligerents, and that is a very serious issue. Um, but it's not a... It's, you know, it's something that we're, you know, aware of this relationship. We're going to continue to monitor. Um, and um, I think, again, the important point here is that it really highlights Putin's desperation um, because he has really failed to meet his strategic objectives on the battlefield. You know, the humanitarian situation is, is dire. Um, so we know that a ceasefire would be the best way to get whether it be food, water, you know, humanitarian needs in, um, as well as medical treatment into into Gaza. Um, we also know that you know Israel has been effective um, in really dismantling Hamas in Gaza. Hamas, you know, cannot conduct the type of um, attack that they conducted on October seventh today. They just don't. They they have been. Um, dismantled into a way where they are not that, that same organization pre-October 7th. Um, we have also urged, you know, Sinwar's death is an opportunity. Um, let's use it. So again, you're seeing Secretary Blinken in the region. Um, I don't have more to add to his comments, but we certainly haven't given up hope. Um, it's something that this administration is going to continue to push for. With his NATO counterparts in Brussels. And, and earlier today, U.S. forces participated in an Iraqi-led operation against ISIS fighters in the Anbar province in Iraq. Our assessment of the operation is still ongoing, and to my knowledge, there were no U.S. personnel injured in the operation. Additionally, I have an update on the two service members wounded in a partnered raid with Iraqi security forces on October 22nd. Earlier this week, the ISF, enabled by personnel from CJTF OIR, conducted strikes and follow-on raids on multiple ISIS locations in central Iraq, targeting several senior ISIS leaders and killing at least seven ISIS operatives. During the operation, two U.S. military personnel were wounded by an explosion while assisting Iraqi forces with site exploitation. While both service members sustained serious injuries, they are in stable condition and are currently en route to Walter Reed Medical Center for follow-on care. Additionally, we recently learned a third service member is being assessed for potential TBI. And as you know, TBI numbers can fluctuate over time. All are in stable condition and receiving the care that they need.